Welcome to week seven of American Government. This week we're going to look at several different topics, one of which is political parties. The different topics we're going to look at in this unit are very much interrelated. Um, we'll look at interest groups, uh, which are groups of people um, kind of organized to do political things, but they're really interested in specific goals and specific types of people. And we'll have a chapter on that where we'll delve into that more. Um, we'll also look at elections, which is how people select the power or the people who will be in power to uh, shape government policy. Um, and political parties that we're going to look at now certainly have a lot to do with elections, and so we will be um, kind of overlapping there a little bit too. And so we have three uh, different subjects that are very much interrelated. Interest groups and political parties have a lot in common, but they are significantly different, and uh, both of them play some role in elections. Um, so. Um, all of this stuff kind of flows together. So uh, we'll be taking this um, time, though, to look at specifically political parties. As I said, we'll also be looking at interest groups in this uh, unit. So we need to distinguish a little bit between political parties and interest groups. And interest groups are usually interested in uh, promoting very specific policy goals. Uh, there, were, there were certain things that they want to promote, usually for the benefit of a finite group of people. You know, for instance, there might be an interest group that's interested in promoting environmental quality. Um, and so they want to protect the environment. That's really all they're concerned about. Or we might have an interest group that's wanting to uh, help um, Army veterans or something like that. So they have a specific group of people they're interested in helping. Uh, but unless they're a really, really broad interest group, uh, they're not really, uh, don't, they don't exist to uh, help all of society. They're really just interested in you know, one small slice of society as a whole. And so interest groups are out to shape government policy to benefit that small group that they're interested in or to, to fit that particular purpose. They're not thinking about the good of all America. Uh, what They may think what they're doing promotes that, but they're really just focused on uh, one or two issues or a very specific group of people. And significantly, they have no interest really usually in running for office and taking charge of the government. So, you know, the Sierra Club, which is an interest group that promotes environmental policy, they don't run candidates for office. You won't see someone running for president on the Sierra Club ticket. Um, and it just doesn't work that way. They seek to influence um, government policy in other ways uh, rather than actually running for office and taking charge of the government. So they don't really want to run the government. Um, they just want the government to respond to the few targeted items on their agenda to benefit the, the cause that they promote or the specific group of people that they're there uh, to promote the rights of. So, uh, in other words, an interest group is usually a little bit narrower uh, than the political party that we'll be talking about now. Unlike an interest group, a political party does, in fact, want to win elections, run the government, and take responsibility for the and welfare of the entire country. And so a much broader focus. They're um, They'll run candidates for office, you know, Democrats or Republicans, for example, they will want to um, get their candidates elected so they can take charge of the government and not just affect one area of policy or help one group of people, uh, but take control of everything and run the whole government for the benefit of the entire country. And so really their goal or reason that they exist is to get their members elected to public office so they can uh, control the levers of government power. Um, because of that, and as we will see looking forward, um, in order to get enough votes to control the government, they are shooting for um, appealing to more than 50% of the electorate, of the people who go to the polls and vote. In order to attract more than half of the population, um, they have to appeal to a very broad cross-section uh, of the voting public, and so they can't be focused on just one narrow thing. Um, whereas an interest group can focus on just one small piece of society, um, a political party, in the United States at least, has to have a broad coalition of support, meaning their agenda has to appeal to lots and lots of Americans. They can't just focus on one issue like the environment. They can't focus on just one uh, set of people, you know, like uh, Army veterans. They have to appeal to a huge uh, swath of American society, or they won't attract enough votes to win elections. When we look at political parties um, in uh, demo democratic countries around the world, uh, some things look very different than they do here in the United States. And I'd just like to take uh, a brief moment to kind of uh, contrast what we have in, in America, unless you think that's the norm around the world, uh, because it's not. Um, in other countries, they have a very different system, and they usually have a lot of little political parties. 
and none of them usually end up with the majority of the votes when they have a national election. And so uh, in most countries uh, that have a democratic form of government, there's a parliament rather than a congress. And the way that you run the government is you elect more people to the parliament than other parties. And so your goal would be if there's 100 members of parliament in your country, you would get 51 people elected to parliament, then you can run the government. And so not only do you control the legislative functions, but also the executive functions, because the leader of the party with the, the most votes in parliament usually becomes the prime minister and has the role that our president uh, does in actually running the government on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, in one of those countries, if you can uh, get half the seats in parliament, uh, then you can run the government. But what ends up happening is there are usually a lot of political parties and not all of them, most of them are very narrow in scope, don't get that many votes, and so they only have a few seats. And so what ends up happen to happen in order for somebody to run the government, they'll have to organize what's called a coalition and get a bunch of these different parties uh, to work together in order to run the government. And so you might have, you know, instead of having 51 uh, seats held by one party, you might have to get, you know, five parties uh, to work together that control 51 seats in the 100-seat parliament in order to get things to work. And so the norm in a lot of countries around the world is we have a ton of little bitty political parties and they all have to kind of work together to make the government work. And so a very different model than what we have in the United States with two major political parties. The reason that you have so many little political parties in these countries is because they use a system called proportional representation. And what that means is that you don't actually have to win um, the election with um, a plurality of the votes in order to win seats in the legislature. And what we mean by that, if you remember, long ago we talked about a simple majority um, and a plurality, and a plurality is just getting more votes than anybody else. Uh, well, in some countries you don't actually have to win the election by getting more votes than everyone else to get seats in the legislature or the parliament. Uh, let's say if you won 20% of the votes, then your party would be given 20% of the parliament seats. And so you could come in sixth in the election and still end up winning some seats in the parliament. And so because of that system, a party does not have to attract many votes to get at least a few of its members elected. And in the United States, remember, we're trying to attract um, basically half of the voting public, or hopefully a little more, uh, to vote for our party. So we have to have a broad appeal. But that's not true in these countries where they... You know, if they got 6% of the vote, they might still get six members of parliament. So they can have, it looks a lot more like an interest group. They can have political parties that appeal to a very uh, narrow part of society, and they will still have some success in elections. And so they don't have to appeal to a broad section of society like American political parties. Um, and because of that, it's really easy to start a new political party and actually, you know, get some results, put some members in parliament, you know, have some electoral success, but there's a side effect to that. It makes the political system pretty unstable um, because, and like we said, many of these little bitty parties have to cooperate in order to run the government, and often they fight with each other and they don't get along really well. And so in order to run the country effectively, uh, usually what happens is after an election in one of these countries, the party that gets the most votes usually tries to work with enough parties that, uh, to kind of work with it that it will control more than half the seats uh, in the parliament. Well, what happens is if any one of those little bitty parties that's making up your coalition uh, gets mad and stops cooperating, takes its ball and goes home, uh, the group of parties that is left uh, may be unable to run the government. And when that happens, um, the government falls, which isn't like an armed revolution or anything like that, but it just means that they call a new election. Um, and so they will, everyone will have to go back to the polls and vote again because the government that they put in power uh, didn't work out. And so they'll have to have a new election. And so we have elections every four years. You know, you can set your watch by it. Uh, you know, you know, years in advance when we're going to have our election. Well, in these countries, we don't know. There might be an election tomorrow. Um, if one of these little parties gets mad and pulls out of the government and the government no longer has enough support to control the majority of the seats in parliament, Suddenly, um, you know, the government falls, it can't run the country anymore, and we'll have a new election. And we never know when the election is going to happen. It can happen on a moment's notice. Well, that creates a lot of instability. Um, and so we can have lots of different people in charge of the government in a very short time. If we have a system where there's lots of little bitty parties and no one's, you know, really the big fish in the pod there, you can have all these little tiny parties uh, trying to work together, and if one of them pulls out, you just have chaos. And again, you know, these little parties, they're not like parties here in the United States because they can appeal to a very 
uh, you know, narrow section of the of society. You could have the retired plumbers party, you know, or the retired teachers party, or the, you know, you name it. I mean, they they are all kinds of little tiny parties that just you know get a few percentage points of the vote, um, but they can have a big impact. And so, because you have so many cooks in the kitchen, uh, that leads to instability. And remember that our main purpose of government is to have order, predictability, and certainty. And when you have a situation where the government can uh, lose power at any moment, and you don't know when the elections are going to be, uh, that actually leads to more instability. So uh, not a terrible system overall. It has some advantages too, but compared to our system, uh, it is a lot more unstable. Um, and so just so you know, uh, not the whole world doesn't look like the United States when you look at the government's governmental systems, and that includes democracies. Uh, so places like you know France have a very different system than we do here in the United States. And so uh, now let's look more at the system we do have in the United States. While much of the world has all these tiny little parties and lots and lots of political parties, in America we don't have that. We have a two-party system. Um, and that has allowed us to have a lot of political stability for well over 200 years uh, since basically the founding of the country. And then the identities of the two parties have changed, but we've mostly had two major parties uh, throughout American history. Since we require a party's candidates to win a plurality of the vote, in other words, to get more votes than everyone else before they can get into office, um, our parties are required to have a broader appeal. And so in countries that have proportional representation, they can appeal to just a few uh, percentage points of the population um, and get those votes and they can have some success, but not so in the United States. There's no uh, prize for second place. Uh, you either pull the most votes and get into office or you go home. Um, and so because of that, that encourages parties to have a much broader appeal. And because parties have to have such a broad appeal, and that makes parties that appeal to a small section of society pretty unworkable. If you just had a party called the Retired Teachers Party, uh, in the United States, you know, that, you know, I don't know how many retired teachers there are out there, but it might attract one or two percent of the vote, but they're never going to get anywhere. Um, they're never going to, you know, poll 51 percent of the vote um, in all likelihood. And so they kind of feel shut out because in these other countries, you can have a niche party that just appeals to one small slice um, of the electorate, but you can't really have that in the United States and really uh, make any headway. And you don't really need more than a couple of parties um, that have that broad of appeal um, in the first place. Um, because um, after you get a couple of parties established that appeal to the public at large, uh, then a new party wouldn't really have much new to say. Um, you know, if you have two parties that roughly each appeal to half of the United States uh, electorate, uh, where are you going to put a third party? You know, they're going to overlap. Um, their views uh, with the two parties that exist. And what usually happens is these two parties take up all the oxygen in the room um, because you have Democrats and Republicans um, currently, um, and the Republicans kind of control the, the right half of the political spectrum, the kind of the conservative side, and the Democrats tend to appeal to the liberal half of the voting public. Uh, so where do you put another party? Because they've already occupied you know, all the space in the room, basically. Uh, and so it's really hard to get a new party in there. And so um, because our system encourages having those large, um, broad-based parties, that really tends to shut down the development um, of other major parties. And so they kind of just choke out these um, little parties because they are, they're just taking up all the room um, in the political system. And so because of that, uh, we have few third parties. And uh, we'll use that term third party to refer to any party that's not one of the major two. And so... Uh, you may have 16 third parties, um, and we won't ever use the term fourth party. I'm not sure why, we just don't. Um, but we have you know, two major parties and then any other party that springs up, and that happens sometimes, but we'll call them a third party. But most of the time, they never get more than a few percent of the votes in an election, and they just don't have much political clout. And so throughout most of our history, we've had those two major political parties that we have uh, struggling for political dominance. Let's talk now about uh, some American history and how we kind of got to the point that we're at now, how this two-party system uh, developed. At the very beginning, our founding fathers who wrote the Constitution uh, really, really hoped that we would never have political parties. They just did not like the concept. They were familiar with it, though, because in England there were political parties. Uh, however, they didn't like them and they didn't want them to develop here. Why were they against it? Well. Um, the Federalist Papers talk about this some, and they talked about the danger of factions, which was their term uh, for a political party. Um, and George Washington even kind of went off on this topic 
as he was giving his farewell address leaving office about the dangers of party politics, and it was already starting to develop in America at that time. Well, the reason they were worried uh, about political parties is they felt they would distort the proper functioning of government. Um, and if everyone in, who is holding political office belonged to a party, they might be more worried about uh, doing what was best for their party rather than doing what was best for the country. And certainly when you go uh, accept a public office, you take an oath to you know support and defend the country and all that, and they were afraid that would create a conflict of interest if doing what was right for your party was different than doing what was right for your country. And so they felt that there was a conflict there. They also uh, really thought that parties were corrupting influence. Uh, that would um, kind of appeal to people's baser instincts of you know, power grabbing and um, that sort of thing. And uh, it would just kind of turn people away from the dignity of public service and helping their fellow man that they thought um, was really what ought to motivate people who are seeking public office. They never mention political parties in the Constitution. Uh, that concept is completely left out. And we can tell, uh, looking at the system that they came up with, um, they never anticipated political parties would take root in America. And if you remember, in the presidential election system that they devised, uh, whoever got the most votes for president would end up becoming the president. Whoever came in second would become the vice president. And that turned out very badly in the election um, of 1800, uh, or I'm sorry, it would be 1796, uh, when John Adams was elected, uh, because his political mortal enemy, Thomas Jefferson, was came in second and got to be his vice president, and so ended up spending most of his term uh, trying to undermine the president. So these two people that were supposed to be working together for the good of the country uh, were plotting each other's demise <laughs> while they were trying to work together running the executive branch, and so uh, that just showed um, how quickly uh, things changed. But clearly the Founding Fathers would never have designed that system if they thought that people uh, would be belonging to different parties and be at each other's throats politically. Um, so they really hoped that political parties would never take root, but of course they did very early. Um, when our government first got started in George Washington's presidency, uh, things were done pretty much by consensus. And consensus just means everyone agrees. Uh, so what would happen is everyone would discuss the issues and they would try to reach an agreement that everyone could live with. You know, we didn't want to leave anyone out. It wasn't, you know, take a take a vote, you know, yay or nay, and whoever, you know, wins the simple majority goes. You know, we try to get everyone on board and, and try to, you know, eliminate all disagreement if possible. Of course, that's very, very hard to do. But the goal was to get as many people to agree to government policies as possible before implementing them. So in this environment, when we're trying to get everyone to agree on everything, there's really little need for political parties because uh, much of the function of political parties present alternatives to voters, uh, so the voters can choose between those alternatives when they go vote in an election. And if everyone's agreeing on everything, there's no need for alternatives, and so there's really no need for political parties at that point. Uh, so if everyone is trying to work together nicely and cooperate, um, the need for a political party, you know, trying to say, you know, nope, what they're saying is wrong, we should do it this way, and that really kind of goes away. And so there's really no need for a political party at the very beginning, at least when everyone was trying to get along and work by consensus. So during uh, George Washington's eight years as president, and that the consensus model was really what they tried to do. Uh, but even during George Washington's term in office, political parties began to emerge. Uh, Washington, uh, when he was elected president, he chose uh, the best and brightest uh, people that he could for his cabinet. And a lot of founding fathers, people whose signatures were on uh, you know, the Constitution and that kind of thing. Uh, so he had a group of people who were very politically minded, and they ended up having different political ideas. And gradually they started kind of gathering into two opposing political camps, and we saw the idea of a party uh, system start to emerge. Uh, for instance, some of them wanted the federal government to get involved in things like building bridges and running a national bank, um, and others just thought that wasn't really uh, the government's business at all. Um, and so they said that when you have the government um, getting involved in business interests and things like that, getting you know trying to take a hands-on approach and running the economy, um, that's going to sow the seeds of corruption in government. Um, because the government will be trying to assist these wealthy business interests and not helping common people and stuff. And so you started to see uh, two kind of enemy political camps start to develop even within Washington's cabinet while he's busy trying to run things by consensus. And so soon these disagreements um, 
came out of cabinet meetings and began to, to polarize the whole country um, as the different members of Washington's cabinet started trying to gather support. You know, they started sniping at each other and stuff, and so we started having um, the beginnings of the political parties developing. George Washington's vice president was John Adams, and he won election as the second president of the United States. Um, and during his administration, uh, the first two-party system uh, really solidified. And Adams became the center of a party known as the Federalists. And don't uh, confuse this with the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists when we're talking about the adoption of the Constitution. Um, this is a new group of people. It's a political party. And that first group arguing about the Constitution was not a political party. They just were arguing about one issue. Um, but Adams' um, party became known as the Federalists, the capital F Federalists, I guess you could say. Um, but they were really um, a political party in the true sense. They had a number of policy issues, not just one issue. Um, and so Adams kind of became the head of that um, party um, as he was our second president. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, who had also been a member of Washington's cabinet, was elected as Adams' vice president. He came in second. And he had been Adams' dear friend earlier in life. Um, but they ended up growing apart and developed very different political ideas. And they just hated each other's guts uh, for much of their lives, for decades. And uh, toward the very end of their lives, they actually reconciled and became friends again. But uh, during this period, they, uh, you know, would, if you mention one's name in the presence of the other, they would spit on the ground. You know, they really disliked each other immensely. Um, and so here you had, you know, the two people supposed to be in charge of the executive branch who um, couldn't stand each other. Um, and Jefferson ended up becoming the leader of the Democratic Republican Party, uh, which opposed most Federalist policies. And so our first two-party system uh, really got started. And during this time, uh, Adams was in office, and Jefferson spent most of his time in office trying to undermine Adams. Um, and so that was a development that led people to realize um, that there was a need to change the Constitution to the current model where the president and vice president are elected together so that they will be able to get along. But this is you know, kind of how they had the ugly birth of the two-party system uh, because our president and vice president were fighting and couldn't get along. Um, and so there we have two parties born, and that really that kind of set the model for how American politics has developed over time. Since that time, um, and early in our history, we've had two major political parties for most of our history. Uh, not entirely, but for most of it. And for various reasons, the Federalist Party collapsed around 1816, uh, left only one party for a while. However, that was a vacuum, and nature abhors a vacuum. So it didn't take long for American politics kind of shake itself out and for another two-party system to emerge. And so by 1828, we had the Democratic Party and the Whig Party. Uh, so again, a two-party system. And the Democrats, uh, which is not the same as the modern Democratic Party, but um, they were led by President Andrew Jackson and did much to make uh, American politics more partisan. Uh, and by that term, we just mean that we are really in, enthused about our party winning. Uh, maybe sometimes at the expense of the common good, and that's debatable. Uh, but certainly, uh, they kind of looked at politics as a zero-sum game. You know, somebody wins, somebody loses. And they wanted to win, and so they were playing to win. They believed in the spoil system, uh, which meant that the winner of an election should reap the benefits of controlling the government. Uh, and ought to be able to implement policies without consulting the opposing party. So we see the death of the whole consensus thing. Uh, elections have consequences. If you win the election, you need to be able to implement your policies, and everyone else can go fly a kite, uh, pretty much. They really wouldn't even try to get along with the opposing party. They would just try to win enough seats in the government um, to where they could control everything and do whatever they wanted to do. And so, uh, perhaps as the Founding Fathers had predicted, par party politics meant that those in office um, could spend a good deal of time looking out for the interests of their party and perhaps at the expense of the common good some of the time. So uh, really uh, some of the dangers of the party system started to become evident, uh, but we certainly uh, had a two-party system. It was here to stay uh, and political parties became more and more important. There was a lot of chaos in the American political uh, landscape prior to the Civil War. Uh, largely because of the issue of slavery. And uh, the Democratic Party was a national party, existed you know, in every state in the United States, uh, but there was a real difference of opinion between North and South on the issue of slavery. And so that really split the Democratic Party uh, down the middle between the Democrats who were pro-slavery and the Democrats who were anti-slavery. And so 
that really kind of threw a grenade into the mix of American politics. Uh, the Whig Party uh, was completely torn apart by regional differences on slavery, so it just didn't even survive. Um, it really just kind of came unraveled because of all the differences of opinion on slavery. It was really hard to hold together a national party uh, when people in the North and people in the South um, saw the issue of slavery, which was a critical issue, so differently. Uh, so for a brief period, the country had no real national parties, uh, but only groups that appealed to regional interests. And in the midst of that confusion, the modern Republican Party was formed um, as an anti-slavery party that appealed uh, to Northerners. And so even though it only had uh, regional appeal just prior to the Civil War, uh, it was able to get its candidate, Abraham Lincoln, elected um, as president. Really, not because they were that strong, but because everyone else was weaker. Um, all the other uh, political parties uh, that existed at the time uh, were even weaker <laughs> than the Republican Party. They appealed to a smaller section of the country and just didn't have as many votes. And so uh, Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in uh, most of the South, uh, but he was elected president. And for the South, that was really the final straw. Um, they, you know, Lincoln was anti-slavery, and the South was just not prepared to tolerate an anti-slavery president. So that was kind of what pushed them out um, of the Union, kind of pushed them towards secession. When Lincoln was elected president, that was just kind of, that was it. That had enough. And so it wasn't the cause of the Civil War, but it was kind of the immediate uh, cause of secession, which led to the Civil War. So, um, but party politics really kind of broke down uh, during that period right before the Civil War. So that's one exception uh, in American history where we didn't really have a strong two-party system in place. After the Civil War, though, things kind of uh, righted once again, kind of turned into a uh, good old familiar two-party system. Uh, the Republicans remained um, as a party, and they mainly appealed to voters in the Northeast and Midwestern industrialized states, um, as well as the overwhelming majority of new black voters. Uh, and for a long, long time, uh, freed slaves and their descendants voted as a block for the Republicans because that was the party of Lincoln. Uh, that's very different from our modern politics today, where uh, if you look at the black vote, it goes overwhelmingly Democratic. Uh, but that was uh, not the case for a really long time because Republicans represented that anti-slavery message. Um, you know, they, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. Um, and so they attracted most of the black vote and a good part of the votes in the North. Uh, in the South, though, no one voted Republican except uh, for black voters, and many of them became intimidated soon um, and uh, were disenfranchised pretty much as we studied in the civil rights um, part of the material. And so during this time, the modern Democratic Party was formed, um, and it returned to the status of a national party, although it did have a regional split within it, um, and northern Democrats often had different priorities than southern Democrats. Um, but nonetheless, the Democratic Party um, became a national party again. So then we had the Republicans and the Democrats um, running everything, which is still what we have today. So our modern system kind of came out of this period. In the South, uh, which you know, most votes uh, were white, in the South, uh, voted overwhelmingly Democratic uh, because they were voting against the party of Lincoln, and that was just something they did. Um, and until fairly recently, like for instance, even in Arkansas, um, until the 1990s, if you wanted to get elected to statewide office, you ran as a Democrat. It didn't really matter what you believed, uh, but only Democrats got elected because everyone voted Democrat. And so um, there was a one-party state, and that's changed now. A lot of Republicans have hold office in Arkansas. Uh, and it's a very conservative state, but uh, at the time it really wasn't about liberal and conservative, it was just um, these regional differences and, and other things. And so um, the South um, was called the Solid South because they always voted Democratic, solidly Democratic, uh, up until the election of 1980. And that's when they all voted for Ronald Reagan, who was a Republican. And so that really changed things, that's what we call a realignment. Um, because they really changed their political allegiances. But that's kind of our modern uh, system that we have now. And so we have this two-party system uh, consisting of Republicans and Democrats that has persisted until the present, although there have been uh, some changes along the way in voting patterns and that kind of thing. Uh, from the turn of the 20th century, uh, 1900 until 1928, uh, there were mostly Republican presidents. Uh, they had a, a long string of success uh, during that period, um, but that you know, those things tend to change and go back and forth. But uh, during that time, that was the era of the progressives uh, who spent most of their time battling big business and monopolies. 
and the, the Republicans were normally elected to office as, as president. And it was you know pretty good times for a lot of that, except for um, World War One in that period. But um, you know the economy was roaring along in the twenties uh, for much of the country, and so um, that's what was going on in those days. Um, and so politics in, during this area, though, were extremely corrupt. Uh, most large cities had what were called political machines. And a political machine is a political organization uh, which is almost always extremely corrupt. If you use that term, that just um, kind of that's part of it. Um, and they controlled local elections and the local government. And what happened uh, would be there'd be a political boss at the head of the organization, the local political party, and he would have lower bosses under him. They would all, you know, it was a hierarchy. The lower bosses would answer to the people above them who would all answer to the big boss ultimately. And clear down to the level of precincts, which uh, were you know the smallest political district you had, which in a large city might be just a few city blocks, uh, you would have uh, this organization that would uh, basically control the politics uh, in that city. Uh, what a political machine, uh, what its job was, uh, was to use whatever means possible to get their candidates elected to office. And then once they got their people in office, uh, the candidates um, that were put there by the machine, uh, they get elected and they would use the local government to hand out favors in exchange for votes. And so if you um, wanted a city job, you had to um, do whatever the political machine wanted you to do. If you wanted a permit so you could build you know, a new office or something, you had to um, do what the political machine wanted. And there was a lot of uh, you scratch my Mac, I scratch yours. It's all about exchanging favors. And it was very, very corrupt. And the political machine uh, would control uh, the electoral process. And so they would make sure the ballot box was stuffed full of votes for their candidates. They'd either buy the votes or they would, uh, you know, stuff the ballot boxes, you know, through voter fraud and that kind of thing. Uh, so they would make sure that their people got elected, if at all possible. If you didn't play by the machine's rules, uh, you could find life in the city pretty difficult. You know, you couldn't get the permits you needed. You wouldn't get a city job. Uh, you know, the city workers wouldn't come fix your sewer line or whatever it was. Um, and so you had to do what the political machine wanted um, and, and kind of play by its rules um, and ex you know, exchange your vote for their favors uh, or you would never get anything done. The political machines basically worked uh, really well because this was before the era of secret ballots. Uh, now, when you go vote in an election, who you voted for is a secret. Nobody can find that out. You know, when you drop your um, ballot paper in the ballot box, um, it doesn't have your name on it. And so no one will know who you really voted for. Uh, but that's not how it worked back then. Uh, there was no secret ballot. And so it was known who people actually voted for. And so if you didn't vote for the machine, uh, they knew that and they would act accordingly. Uh, and so that enabled them to keep their little power structure in place um, in exchanging your vote for their favors, and so they were able to uh, keep the system running that way. Um, and political machines didn't really stop there, um, at, you know, just with handing out favors in exchange for votes. Um, so as we said, sometimes they would just manufacture the ballots they needed to win elections, and they would just um, stuff the ballot box. And sometimes the same people would vote five or six times, for instance. Of course, we're only supposed to vote once. Uh, sometimes dead people would show up and vote, and somehow uh, they would uh, cast their ballot, even though they you know, were um, in the cemetery. So uh, however they, they did it, they, you know, they would make sure they got enough votes uh, to keep their system in place. And corruption and machine politics were very widespread around the country. Uh, certainly New York and you know, other big cities had their problems. Um, but one of the biggest and most notorious political machines was in Kansas City, uh, where Tom Pendergast was the, the political boss, and he controlled city politics for years. And his machine was so powerful that he could manufacture enough votes to throw statewide races. And so if you wanted to be governor, you had to talk to Tom Pendergast, or if you wanted to be, you know, the you know, attorney general of Missouri, or whatever the case might be, and because he could throw uh, statewide elections. And so um, it just became a huge problem. It was very corrupt. Eventually, people got sick of this corruption, and reforms were uh, introduced to combat uh, these problems. And one of the best uh, reforms to take care of this was the secret ballot, which is also known as the Australian ballot, because the Australians, I guess, came up with this idea. Uh, but this was designed to make sure that somebody's vote was not known. And so you could tell the political machine, oh, yeah, I'll vote for you. And then when you go to the 
a voting booth, you might actually vote for somebody else. And so because they didn't have that power over you anymore, because they didn't know your vote, um, then they couldn't hold you to vote for who they wanted. And so and that was a way of ensuring that they would um, basically not be able to do that exchange favorites for votes thing anymore. And so that caused them to lose a lot of power. Another reform was the direct primary. And uh, before we had direct primaries like we have today, um, in order to decide uh, which candidate the Democratic Party or Republican Party was going to put forward to run for office, um, basically the people who ran that party would get together in a back room, you know, filled with cigar smoke and whiskey and whatever, and they would talk it over and end up picking a candidate. And that, that was who that party chose to run for that office. Well, that allowed the party boss to hand pick the candidates that they wanted. And so if you were on his good side, that's uh, who your party got to choose, you know, would choose you to run for office. And so that's who the people got to vote for. Um, and that's not really uh, fair, at least to corruption. And so now we have a system where the voters actually get to go. And there may be, uh, you know, six Democrats running for uh, state governor, for instance. But the voters will get to go choose which Democrat they want to be the nominee of their party. Um, and then the Republicans will do the same thing. And then in the general election, uh, we will have um, only two candidates, one Democrat and one Republican, but they've actually been chosen by the people. And rather than in some back room somewhere with some dirty deals with party bosses involved. And so the direct primary and the secret ballot really kind of um, cut right at the heart of the power of these political machines uh, and kind of eviscerated them and made them recede a little bit and be less of a problem. In many ways, uh, we can look at the year 1932 when Franklin Roosevelt was elected as kind of kicking off the modern era of party politics um, a little bit. And from then on, uh, we had the Democrats and Republicans comprising our two-party system and standing for much of the beliefs that we would recognize as modern today. Um, and nowadays, the Democrats uh, are, tend to be a little more liberal, tend to champion the idea that the federal government you know, has a role in stepping in and controlling the economy, um, you know, making sure that people have jobs and um, supporting businesses with government programs and things like that, making sure that poor folks, you know, have a safety net and all that kind of thing, those those kinds of issues, being a champion of labor unions and that sort of thing. Now, Republicans are more conservative, want to keep government out of um, our lives, a lot of, in most senses, at least economically, um, want to keep it out of the way of business, want businesses to be able to be unregulated and kind of do their thing, um, and want lower taxes and that sort of stuff. And all those um, kind of modern beliefs um, kind of were really solidified in this era when Franklin Roosevelt was first elected uh, during um, kind of the height of the Great Depression, and he was elected to kind of put a stop to that. And he won uh, re-election, um, or well, he was elected four times, I could say. He was re-elected three times. He finally died while he was um, in his fourth term in office in the middle of World War II. Um, and so, um, as although there were some Republican presidents along the way, Democrats tended to, to dominate national politics up until 1980. Uh, they controlled both houses of Congress for most of this time, both the House and the Senate, and you know, had the presidency a good amount of that time as well. And so especially with congressional politics, the Democrats tended to dominate, and 1980 was kind of um, a turning point uh, when Ronald Reagan was elected. So the presidential election of 1980 is what we call a political realignment, and that's an election when voting patterns really shift a huge amount, um, so much so that the relative positions of the two parties change. And 1980 was certainly um, a big year for Republicans. Um, in that year, uh, Ronald Reagan won um, the presidency, just completely blew Jimmy Carter out of the water. It was just ugly if you're a Carter supporter. So uh, Reagan uh, ended up sweeping into office with a huge majority of the votes. And what was really remarkable is that voters in the South, who since the Civil War had been voting Democratic you know, in every election, uh, pretty much, voted overwhelmingly for Reagan, who was a Republican. And so that really... Uh, was kind of a wow moment because it really you know, flipped um, all these states in the South from Democratic states to Republican states. So since that election, the South has been almost as reliably Republican as it used to be reliably Democratic. And so uh, if you look at presidential elections, uh, states like um, Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia, you know, those 
uh, Tennessee, those uh, southern states, uh, they vote for the Republican every single time, and that was not the case up until 1980. They used to vote for the Democrat every single time. Republicans also made um, other gains in 1980, um, and since then, uh, they've taken control of both houses of Congress in the 94 elections. That was the first time that they had uh, taken control of the House of Representatives um, in decades. Um, they won the presidential elections of 84, 88, 2000, and 2004 uh, since then. So the Republicans kind of became more of a power uh, since 1980 um, after a lot of years of Congress being dominated by the Democratic Party. And these things just kind of go um, in cycles. And since the election of 2008, the Democrats um, appear to be on the upswing quite a bit. Of course, Barack Obama, who was a Democrat, uh, won the 2008 election. Democrats regained control. Um, of Congress in 2006 as well, so they controlled both the executive and the legislative branches there for a couple of years. Um, Obama was re-elected in 2012, although Democrats uh, lost control of both houses of Congress in 2014, and so things kind of just go back and forth uh, with that. It often seems that the voters will trend toward one party for a few election cycles, and then they'll trend the other way for a few election cycles uh, after the other party kind of gets back on its feet. And so what has really stayed constant throughout all these changes is the two-party system. Uh, you know, who's in charge, Democrats or Republicans, kind of goes back and forth, as we've seen. Uh, but the system itself is really, really stable. Uh, we have that two-party system, which appears to be really, really ingrained into our political culture, um, and it keeps reasserting itself, even if one of the parties collapses, another one will come up to take its place. Um, you know, if one party gets thrown out of office, you know, it'll come back uh, later. So that system uh, just, you know, kind of sticks around even if uh, the party that's in power uh, keeps changing. We're going to look at and see why that two-party system that we have is so durable and long-lasting. Before we do, though, let's look at some of the benefits of having a system like this. For starters, we've already seen one of the alternatives, proportional representation, uh, that has little parties that can't appeal to a broad portion of the electorate. As we've already noted, that can lead to significant instability because those different parties have very different ad agendas. Sometimes they clash, and uh, trying to get the, enough of them to work together to form a government, uh, a majority in the parliament, that can be pretty challenging, and one of them can pull out at any time. <clears throat> and if that happens, then the government may fall, and we have new elections at an unpredictable uh, time. And so often the countries that have this other system uh, go through several different leaders in a very short time. On the other hand, our system has proven much more predictable and stable. Uh, we don't have unscheduled elections uh, because uh, we elect our people to be there for a specific term, and we also don't have to worry about all these little parties having to work together. We just have two major parties, and you know sometimes they will trade off. One's in charge and the other is, and it goes back and forth, but that provides a lot more stability than having, you know, say, 30 little parties um, trying to work together in kind of an unpredictable way. And so we do have a lot more predictability and certainty uh, through the system that we have. It's not perfect, certainly. And there would be people that would tell you the proportional system is better because that gives a voice uh, to people, um, gets them the opportunity to serve in government. In our system, their little bitty party would get swallowed up pretty quickly. Uh, and so you can look at the pros and cons, but our system does provide a lot of stability. And of course, that's one of the key functions of government is to provide that stability, order, and certainty. And so that is a good thing. So then, why does our two-party system stick around? And again, the parties are not mentioned in the Constitution. We don't have to have the system that we do. It's just kind of what grew up. Um, in the American system of politics. So why in the world do we have this system that hangs around so long? Well, one reason is tradition. Uh, we've nearly always had two parties. If you look at American history, there's only been a few years that we didn't have um, basically a two-party system. And so we've just become accustomed to that. We are used to going to vote and seeing Republicans and Democrats on the ballot. You know, and um, living memory, uh, those two parties have dominated American politics. And so um, it's kind of, you know, things have inertia. They're hard to change sometimes. And so when people are used to voting uh, for those two major parties or candidates from those parties, it takes a lot to make them change their mind and adopt some new party. Uh, they're just kind of stuck in a rut, I guess you could say. A second reason is that the two parties are self-perpetuating to some degree. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, Republican parents tend to bring forth little Republicans, and Democratic parents tend to bring forth little Democrats. You know, the family is a big influence on forming your political um, philosophy and opinions. And so 
Uh, of course, you don't always agree with your parents on everything, certainly, but that does have a, play a role. And if you grew up, you know, thinking of things in a Republican way or a Democrat way, um, that tends to influence your thinking, too. And so there's that continuity we have from one generation to another and that tends to reinforce the two-party system. A big factor um, in why the system hangs around is the commonality of values. And we talked about that um, back when we looked at what forms people's political opinions, what has a factor on that. We know that we have a lot of common values that bind us together in this country, and that tends to create a very stable political environment. Because our values are so close together, uh, we just don't need all that many parties representing us. You know, we, we have two, and that, they pretty much catch it all. Um, and, you know, there just aren't that many um, fringe groups um, because we have these common values that kind of uh, really kind of focus us on the political center. Uh, in the United States, there just aren't that many communists, socialists, populists, or, you know, people that are kind of on the fringes of the political spectrum. Uh, there just aren't that many of them. Uh, most people agree on most things. They may think they don't, but if you go kind of drilling down, they will still have those common values um, that kind of bind them together. And so, there's really not um, a diverse number of political views that would support multiple parties. Um, the two that exist uh, pretty much encompass people's main political views. Um, and so currently, the Democrats tend to represent the liberal side of the political spectrum, kind of that, that half. They're uh, certainly more centered than, you know, a communist or a flat-out socialist would be or something like that. And likewise, the Republicans tend to represent kind of the center-right and the political spectrum, uh, conservative, uh, more than anything else, but, you know, pretty close to the center. And so those two parties kind of suck up um, all the room there uh, on the political spectrum where other parties could exist. Uh, they just haven't been able to find a niche. And remember that the parties have to appeal to a broad system of the electorate in the United States or they just can't succeed. They have to appeal to roughly 50% of the people. And we already have two parties that do that. It's really just hard to find room for a third. And we just really don't need it because the parties that exist um, already embody most of our values because they're we have a lot of common values together in America. Our electoral system also has a role to play in propping up the two-party system, um, and that's how we do elections. Um, we've already talked about this, but our system is uh, sometimes referred to as a winner-take-all, and there is no uh, prize for second place in our electoral system. Um, so. If you come in second, that means you lose. You either win and get elected, or you don't. Um, and so there's really no uh, benefit to having a party that can just attract a small number of votes, because the object is to win. And if you can't win, um, your party usually shrivels up and blows away pretty quickly. Uh, so under this system that we have, a political party is not going to be viable unless it can win elections. It can get a majority of the votes. Just getting a few votes isn't enough. Um, so, in order to do that, again, a party must appeal to around half of the voting public in order to win elections and even get a seat at the table. Um, and so our existing parties tend to crowd out the third parties. And they already have their agendas that appeal to most of the American electorate, and so it's really hard for a third party to come along, um, find a niche, some way to distinguish itself from the two parties that exist, um, and be able to gain enough support uh, to be viable, um, because... Again, unless they can attract about half the votes, they're just um, not going to really accomplish anything. And so people don't want to vote for something that isn't accomplishing anything. So uh, the way our system is set up, it really just kind of discourages having uh, third parties develop. We also have requirements for getting on the ballot that tends to discourage uh, small parties. And for some races, uh, especially you know statewide races for U.S. Senator or Governor, uh, there's a requirement that a candidate get a certain number of signatures on a petition before you can even get your name on the ballot. So just because you want to run for governor, um, you can't just go down you know, to the courthouse and sign up to run for governor. Um, you, before that, you have to go around and get people to sign a petition saying they support you. Um, and so that's designed to limit the number of names on the ballot. And to people who actually have enough political support, they might uh, stand some kind of chance of winning. Um, the alternative to having this system would be to let every crackpot, you know, with nothing better to do, submit their name um, as a candidate and get on the ballot. And so if that happened, 
Um, you know, you I think every small town has those people that write the kind of half-baked letters to the editor uh, griping about things. And so all those people, if they wanted to, they could run for governor. Um, and so you'd go to vote for governor and your ballot, you know, would be 20 pages long listing all these people that wanted to run uh, for office. And so uh, we have to have some kind of way to limit them. And the way to do that is to uh, make them go out and get uh, prove that they have some support in the community uh, through these petitions before we'll let them get on the ballot. And so um, that's just kind of cutting down uh, the number of people that we see when we go to vote. Well, this requirement discourages candidates for small third parties who have a limited amount of support. And gathering these signatures takes time and it takes money and effort. <clears throat> and so these little parties uh, aren't going to have as many resources. And there may not have that much support in the first place. Maybe not that many people would sign their petition. And so this discourages the development of third parties by having these kinds of requirements. And so that also tends to cut down um, on third parties, which tends to perpetuate our two-party system. <clears throat> Another major reason that third parties uh, tend to fail when they do spring up is that people are afraid of wasting their vote. Um, occasionally, we will have a third party candidate emerge, uh, especially um, in presidential elections. Every now and again, somebody will come along who represents a third party. Uh, we had Ross Perot uh, running in uh, 1992 and 96 for the Reform Party, which was a third party. Uh, we had um, uh, the Green Party candidate in 2000 that probably swung the election uh, to George W. Bush. Uh, so occasionally we'll, we'll, we will have a third party candidate uh, turn up. However, they don't usually tend to attract that many votes uh, because uh, if they're not already a member of one of the two established parties, people are just reluctant to vote for them. And the reason for that is they feel like these third party candidates don't stand much of a chance of winning and they don't want to throw away their vote on somebody who doesn't have a chance. Remember the bandwagon effect that we talked about? Uh, with public opinion, uh, well, people don't want to be associated with a loser. They don't want to go around saying, look, I voted for a loser. You know, they want to feel like their vote made a difference and that their candidate has a chance of winning. And they see how the system works, that, you know, the system's kind of stacked against third parties. And so they don't want to risk wasting their vote by casting it for a third party. And that ends up being kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because if um, everyone's afraid they're not going to win so they don't vote. Well, guess what? They're not going to win <laughs> because nobody voted. Um, and so it's kind of a vicious cycle that they get into, but people just don't want to feel like they wasted their vote by voting for one of these third-party candidates who they believe don't really have a realistic chance of success. Well, having said all that, we do have third parties in the United States, and they're not terribly successful, um, but they do exist. And once in a while, they'll have a little moment in the sun uh, where they will have some good results for a while. However, they usually don't last very long before they fade away into history. And for instance, we talked about uh, the 1992 presidential election where Ross Perot uh, ran as a Reform Party candidate, really made a big splash. For a while, he was ahead in the polls in front of both the Republican and the Democratic candidates, um, but it ended up he didn't win a single electoral vote um, you know, by the time we got to the real election in November. So um, and then he came back in 96 and performed even less well, and then that party just kind of faded away as soon as he did. So um, some of them will just kind of be a flash in the pan. Others will stick around for a long time, uh, but gather very little support. Um, and for instance, right now, um, you'll see uh, some third parties on the, can on the ballot when you go vote in a statewide election, for instance, governor or um, U.S. Senator or something like that, there will be third parties, but they usually get, you know, one or two percent of the vote. They just don't get uh, much support. <clears throat> so if you look at an election ballot today, uh, you will see some other parties on there besides just the Democrats and Republicans. Uh, libertarians usually have a candidate for statewide office. Um, they struggle, though, to get out of the single digits. Uh, they, that party has stuck around for a really long time, uh, but they just don't have any success getting their people elected. And they're more on the right wing side. And so the Republicans kind of take uh, the oxygen out of the room for them. Um, and so most of the conservative type folks end up running as a Republican rather than a libertarian. Um, and so they end up kind of being seen as a fringe party and people just don't vote for them in large numbers. And you'll also see candidates for things like the Constitutional Union Party or the Green Party. Uh, and those parties have been around for quite a while, but they just get very little support. And so that seems to be the trend when third parties do spring up, they will either stick around for a long time, but get very little support and just kind of hum along, never really electing anyone to office usually or making much of an impact. 
or we'll have you know some kind of flash in the pan sort of candidate who will come along, make a big splash, uh, but fade away very quickly. And so the, the two-party system just kind of reasserts itself and keeps right on going. As we said, there have also been some third parties that enjoy a good deal of success for a brief moment in time, uh, but their day in the sun doesn't really last very long, and soon they disappear and fade away. Uh, a few examples of that, in the early 20th century, the Prohibition Party enjoyed some success, and it was built around a single issue, and that was prohibiting the consumption and manufacture of alcoholic beverages. Um, and Prohibition was in fact made law uh, for a while, it was later repealed, uh, but once Prohibition had been passed and there was a constitutional amendment that outlawed uh, liquor in the entire United States, then there was no reason for that party to exist anymore because that was really the reason it was founded. And so once um, it achieved its goal, it just kind of disappeared because there was nothing left for it to do. We already mentioned the Reform Party, uh, which enjoyed some success in the 1990s. Um, however, the Reform Party proved to be really largely the phenomenon uh, that was built around one man. That was Ross Perot. And he ran for president twice. And there was um, Governor Jesse Ventura of Minnesota was actually elected as a Reform Party candidate, a former wrestler, kind of a colorful figure. Um, but there was a little bit of success with the Reform Party, but just a little bit. Um, and in large measure, it faded away. Uh, once Ross Perot lost interest in it, it uh, lost a lot of its momentum. And so it just kind of disappeared as a political force. So we see that third parties do come and go, um, but the system seems happiest and balanced and stable when we have those two major parties. And between them, they attract almost all of the votes. And so that's really how the system is set up. It's really stacked against these third parties having any success uh, long term. And so we see um, the two major parties really uh, ruling the roost for the most part, and third parties just kind of come and go once in a while. Um, sometimes we have small ones that stick around and just attract one or two percent of the vote, but they usually don't have that much impact. <clears throat> Let's switch gears now and talk about what political parties actually do. What are their functions? Um, what, um, why do we have them around? What do they do? Um, what role do they play in our politics? Well, one of the major jobs that parties do is to recruit people to run for public office. Uh, most people uh, in their right mind at least, would never want to subject themselves to the pressures and public scrutiny that comes with elected office. And I'm sure you're familiar with politicians who have had dirty things and secrets from their past come up, and we'll see that happen in elections from time to time. Uh, but, you know, when you run for office, your entire life is under a microscope. And there's a lot of pressure, it's very stressful, and your family life suffers and all those kinds of things. And so that's a huge burden. And uh, throw in the fact that if you run for office and lose, it's humiliating. Um, you know, we don't like rejection. You know, we ask someone out on a date and they turn us down. You know, that, that, that's humiliating. And well, imagine if, you know, you're doing that in front of the entire country or the entire state, you know, and people reject you. Um, so that's taking a huge risk to, you know, that's a blow to your ego if you lose an election. And so there's, there's really a high personal cost that comes with running for office. Because of that, it's hard to find people who want to put up with that. You know, people want to do public service and do good things, but finding someone who wants to take those risks and go through that process sometimes is fairly difficult. And people who do that are either, you know, very noble public servants, they really want to serve their country, uh, they're wildly ambitious, they're, they really want power, um, or maybe a combination of both of those things. And so uh, it's kind of a rare breed of people that uh, do a good job of being a politician and really want to do that. Well, political parties do a good job of finding those people, um, finding those who are willing to serve in public office and grooming them for the job. And, you know, it's not an accident a lot of times that somebody runs for a particular office. You know, someone might never have thought of running for governor, uh, but somebody from the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, you know, comes up to them and says, well, you know, we think you'd make, uh, be a really good candidate and a strong candidate, and we would support you, you know, if you thought about running for this office. And so they will kind of start that conversation and get people thinking about that. And, you know, the whole purpose of the political party is to get its members elected. And so the leadership of the party is always looking for those folks. And a lot of times people get their start, you know, at the local level. They'll serve on a city council or a school board. And the leadership of the party can spot talent, you know, even on the school board or something like that. And might say, well, have you thought of running for the state legislature? Um, have you thought about running for Congress? Um, and so they can spot, you know, that political talent and kind of recruit people 
into those roles. And so that's how some people find their way into politics is because, you know, the political parties play an active role in trying to recruit people uh, to run for those offices. <clears throat> political parties also have the function of screening candidates. Um, they will usually narrow our choices down to two. Uh, we'll have um, primary elections um, earlier in the year, a lot of time in Missouri, that's in August, um, or um, maybe even earlier for the presidential election. Uh, but the general election is in November. By the time we get to the November election, uh, we'll have narrowed down the candidates um, from maybe half a dozen to two, uh, one Republican and one Democrat usually. And so political parties play a role in that um, through that primary election process. And so uh, what happens is that, you know, when we have an open seat, you know, let's say the governor of Missouri, there may be half a dozen Democrats and half a dozen Republicans that want to run for that office. However, we will go through that primary election process where the Democrats will choose which Democrat they want to represent their party running for that office. The Republicans will choose one uh, nominee out of their six candidates. They will nominate that person for the office of governor, and then we'll choose between those two nominees, one Democrat and one Republican, when we vote in the general election in November. And so the primary election process um, really sorts that out. We start out with 12 people running, we end up with two, one Republican and one Democrat. So that makes for a much easier choice in the general election. It really uh, brings things to a head, narrows things down a lot to where we have a much more manageable um, election cycle. Um, and the process helps to weed out the candidates who are kind of marginal. Uh, usually the cream of the crop will rise to the top there the candidates who are most articulate, have the best ideas, and the best resources for running the campaign will be the ones that win in the primary election. And then that's the one that has the best chance, probably out of everyone from their party, to win the general election. And so by the time we get to that general election, the weaker candidates will have been kind of washed out. And so political parties um, help fulfill that function of kind of screening out candidates and letting the best ones come through. Political parties also uh, organize political campaigns and help to run elections. And a modern election campaign is a very complicated business, and it costs a lot of money. Um, there's all kinds of money that needs to be raised for advertising. There's professional staff that work on these campaigns. Uh, they will do opinion polls to know how well their message is getting across and make any adjustments that they need to to attract uh, the votes that they need. And all of that stuff you know, takes really skilled people. It takes a lot of money. And it takes you know, some know-how, some, know some organizational skills. And political parties can provide you know, those tools. And so political parties are often instrumental in helping their candidates perform these tasks so they can win an election. You, know, you can have the best candidate in the world, but if you have a really poorly organized campaign, they're not going to get very far. And so political parties can play a role in helping them organize their campaign. And we've already seen uh, parties also uh, run primary elections, which helps to narrow down that list of candidates um, for the general election. So um, through this process, they can be very helpful. Yet another function of political parties is helping voters to sort out candidates. And by that, we mean trying to figure out what those candidates stand for. Uh, most Democrats have political positions uh, that are similar to other Democrats. Uh, there are certainly outliers to that. Not all Democrats are, you know, made from the same mold. And or all Republicans, you know, are not alike either. Some are more liberal, some are more conservative. Others, you know, have different beliefs on certain issues. Um, but we still know something about them from their party affiliation because they wouldn't be in that party if they didn't share a lot of its beliefs. And so uh, knowing what party a candidate belongs to tells us uh, something about that candidate. And so just by seeing uh, that D for Democrat or R for Republican next to a candidate's name, um, tells us something about their political philosophy, even if we don't know anything about the candidate, him or herself. Um, and so we may not be familiar with that individual, but we do know something about them based upon which party they belong to. And so a voter who isn't all that informed about a particular candidate in a race can vote for a candidate based on that party affiliation, because most candidates put forward by either the Democrats or the Republicans uh, will probably share most of that party's views. And maybe not all, uh, and they may differ on some things. If people are individuals, but we can tell something about them based upon their party affiliation. And so that can actually be helpful uh, to people trying to sort through um, candidates in a race, trying to figure out who believes. They can make some assumptions that may not be 100% correct, but they can uh, figure something out, uh, usually about what the candidate is likely to do and how they see the world based upon their party affiliation. Parties also assist with that marketplace of ideas that we've talked about. Uh, by putting forward competing proposals, 
uh, for policy, and they generate debate about those alternative ideas. And so um, we talked about how important the marketplace of ideas is in a democracy that you know, we all uh, talk about the different ideas we have for the country's future, and we will kind of hash out our differences, talk about the good points and the bad points, and try to figure out where the country is headed and what policies we should actually adopt. And parties are very helpful in trying to uh, get new ideas out into that marketplace. They will adopt specific proposals and put those forward, and that helps us um, be able to debate the issues in a meaningful way. In every presidential election, um, parties hold a national convention. And one of the purposes of that is to nominate a candidate from that party for president. However, they also have another purpose, which is to choose the party platform. And the platform is a formal statement of the party's stands on various issues. And so the party membership, well, the delegates that are sent there uh, to the convention will sit around and talk about the various issues and try to figure out uh, what should be in their platform. And the platform will normally um, present uh, policy approaches on dealing with uh, problems facing the country. So, you know, there might be a plank in the platform talking about how do we deal with uh, economic problems? How do we create jobs? There might be one talking about how do we deal with foreign challenges? You know, how do we deal with terrorism or uh, North Korea or something like that? Um, and there might be, you know, other things, you know, how do we deal with health care reform or whatever, but they'll put all their policy proposals together in kind of a formal document um, talking about what they believe and the policies they want to adopt, uh, which is why we should vote for them. If we like their policies, you know, vote for us, this is what we'll do. And so they will put out um, all these different ideas. And so throughout the presidential campaign, uh, the two candidates, um, the Democrat and the Republican, will debate about which approach is the best. And so they will be talking about these ideas. And the, this platform is kind of the basis of their campaign. You know, if you elect me, this is what I will fight for. Um, and so they really get those ideas out there and talk about them. And so the parties provide a great service um, by articulating different approaches to problems and generating discussions about the alternative ideas. And so they will um, fulfill a pretty important role and helping us have this discussion, you know, what's important, you know, what are we, what problems do we want to tackle in this country, how do we want to address those problems, which, you know, what direction should the country go moving forward, um, and so they will help that marketplace of ideas by getting those things out there. Another function of political parties is providing a service, really, uh, and that's accepting responsibility for running the government and providing leadership. And, of course, the whole reason that a political party exists is to get its members elected to office. And their goal is to get themselves elected into all the offices that run the government. They want to run the government. They want to take responsibility for controlling government policy and setting a direction for the country. And so they, you know, take that burden upon themselves willingly. Um, they want to help shape the country's destiny and uh, put us into the direction they want us to go. And so they'll try to get as many of their members elected as possible so that they can take the reins of government. They'll get as many congressmen elected so they can control Congress. They'll try to get their candidate elected as president so they can implement that platform of policies uh, that they put forward and turn that into reality. Because parties have that coherent agenda and plan of action, uh, they can do a great job of setting the direction for the country once they gain power. Uh, sometimes they do better than others. Uh, but at least they have a plan going in. You know, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to accomplish. And so it's not just chaos. You know, they don't get elected and then like, oh, what do we do now? You know, they, they have a plan. Um, and so that can be a real benefit. And you may not always um, agree with their policies once they're in power, but I think we can probably agree that's a good thing when the government has goals and a purpose. And parties uh, can provide that sort of vision and leadership. Um, that it takes to provide a direction for the country, you know, rather than just get there and sit around eating bonbons, you know, and not knowing what to do, and by virtue of the fact that they've run for office, they've developed a platform, you know, they campaign on these ideas and had those discussions, once they get to Washington, uh, they have an idea of the, the policies they want to enact, the things that they want to accomplish, and so parties have a real role um, in providing that national leadership, um, you know, they're uh, candidates to get elected to Congress and the presidency and, and wherever hopefully will work together and try to accomplish um, some good good things for the country. So they help provide uh, that leadership. Finally, another function that parties can provide is that of the loyal opposition. And this is happens when they're actually out of power, after they've lost elections, when they're not in control of the presidency, maybe not control of Congress either, uh, but they can still uh, provide a valuable service 
um, even if we if they didn't succeed in getting elected into office. What happens if uh, most of a party's candidates don't get elected, of course, um, they won't control any of the branches of government, maybe, but they will still have members in place. Uh, they'll have members uh, in Congress. Uh, they, they won't normally get completely wiped out, so even if they're in the minority, they will have a lot of members in the House of Representatives, uh, a lot of people in the Senate, um, and maybe other offices as well. And so even if they can't you know, hold the reins of government and control where we're headed, um, they will still be there, um, and they will still play a valuable role because they will not sit back quietly and just let the party in power lead. Um, they will be voicing concerns all the way, saying, um, I don't think you should do that, you know, this is what could happen, you know, I think this would be a better idea. And so that a discussion over policy alternatives will continue um, because they are there offering an alternative vision. And they'll be trying to convince anyone who will listen to them, you know, don't listen to this party who's in power, you know, you should be doing something else. And so um, they will, you know, continue contributing to that marketplace of ideas even if they are not in power. And um, they're actively going to be probably opposing the agenda of the other party in power. Um, but, of course, they're still loyal Americans. You know, they're committed to serving the country's best interests. They just think that those interests would be served by following a different policy. And so it's not like they're committing any kind of treason if they don't support the president's policies or the policies of Congress. Um, they just genuinely believe that a different uh, path would be better. And so they're going to be, you know, staying true to America, but, you know, trying to uh, get out that alternative vision of what would be best um, to do rather than what the party in power is doing. So they may disagree uh, with the policies of a president from a different party, for example, but they will still respect him as their president. They, you know, they will still um, you know, do what he says if they have to. They might just argue about it. Um, and that arguing is a valuable service um, because this keeps the majority party on its toes. Uh, they're presenting, you know, this opposition party is presenting policy alternatives. And, you know, we don't know. They might turn out to be better ideas. Maybe the next election people will say, oh, you know, that party that wasn't in power had some really good ideas. Let's put them in power and see what happens. And so um, that those ideas keep percolating. And the party that's out of power plays a valuable role by keeping a watch on the party that is in power and also by presenting some alternative ideas. And so we still have um, some competing policy proposals that we can choose from, uh, and that's helpful. That helps our democracy. We've been talking a lot about what parties do. Uh, one thing we haven't talked much about is uh, who uh, parties are, you know, who makes up the party. Um, and there's actually several answers to that question. Uh, it's not as easy to answer as you might think. Uh, one obvious answer is the people in office who belong to that party, the people that ran as a Republican and got elected, for example, or the people who ran as a Democrat and got elected into office. Certainly they would belong to that party. Um, interestingly enough, uh, before we go any further, uh, it's worth noting that party affiliation uh, does not restrict how members of a party act once they get elected. Um, you could get elected as a Democrat, for example, and even though 99% of other Democrats you know, vote a particular way on an issue, you may um, see it differently and vote the other way. And there's really nothing they can do about that except try to persuade you. So, for example, there's nothing uh, to stop a Republican in Congress from going against all of his Republican colleagues and voting with the Democrats on a piece of legislation. Um, remember, there is a whip who will try to change his mind, probably, and convince him to vote with them, but there's no uh, legal means to force members of a party to vote with other members of their party. Um, and so they really have no uh, power except just persuasion to keep their members of their own party in line. <clears throat> and so people do have their own minds. Just because you're elected as a Republican doesn't mean you agree with everything that other Republicans say, and so you may vote against them on some issues. Um, and so that's important to understand. I just wanted to bring that up. Um, and that's not the case in some countries um, where members of a party can be forced by the party leadership to vote a certain way. Um, and if they don't, they'll just get kicked out of the party. Um, and that happens sometimes in other countries. Um, but it's not like that in the United States. And so just because you have an R next to your name doesn't mean you're going to vote with all your Republican colleagues on every single issue. Uh, there's nothing to force you to do that. Uh, but having said that, uh, certainly the people who are in office, um, you know, got elected as a Democrat, you know, they're, they're certainly a member of the Democratic Party. Um, and so that's one answer to that question of who is the party. But there are other answers as well. The party also includes regular members of the public who identify with that party. Um, so a lot of people will go around saying, well, I'm a Democrat, you know, I've been a Democrat my whole life, you know, or, you know, I vote Republican. You know, those people that will self-identify um, as belonging to that party, you know, they will 
uh, see themselves as members of that party, even though they've never run for office, never intend to. Um, they just tend to vote that way. They believe those things that the party stands for. Uh, and so that's another answer to our question. In some states, there's actually a formal process um, to register as a member of a political party. Um, and that is not the case in Missouri. Um, but in those states where you have to register as a member of a party or an independent, meaning that you're not a member of any party, um, they won't let you vote in the party's primary elections unless you are a registered Democrat or a registered Republican. Um, and so that kind of makes sense because why would you want, you know, Democrats sneaking into the Republican primary and, you know, messing up those results? And that's called a closed primary system. Uh, Missouri actually has an open primary system, which means that anybody can vote uh, in the Democratic primary or the Republican primary, however they're feeling that day. You can't vote in both. You have to choose. But if you show up um, on the day of the primary election, uh, they'll ask you, do you want a Democratic ballot or a Republican one? Uh, or maybe something else if there's a third party. And so um, you can tell them, you know, you can change your mind, you know, from one election to the next, you know, which primary election you want to vote in, um, and then they'll just let you vote. And so that's an open primary. But, of course, that might let people who really aren't Democrats vote in the Democratic primary and you mess up their results. And, you know, I guess theoretically, uh, a bunch of people who wanted to mess up the Democratic Party could uh, vote, you know, in the Democratic primary and vote for the weakest possible candidate. You know, theoretically that could happen. But in some states you actually have to register um, as a member of the party. And so that, you know, makes it easy to spot people who are Republicans or Democrats. Not so in Missouri, though. Um, so and for the most part, you know, certainly in states like Missouri, anyone can say, I'm a Republican, and you are. Uh, and so uh, both of the parties can count, you know, millions of Americans um, who, you know, as part of the party who just self-identify as I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat and, and tend to vote that way. One important point to make is just because you say that you're a Democrat or you're a Republican and you self-identify in that way, that doesn't mean that you can't vote for someone who belongs to the other party um, in the general election. Uh, and the truth is that if you look at how voters vote, uh, most of them end up casting ballots for members of both parties at one time or another, even in a single election. Uh, and that's called voting on a split ticket uh, because you split your votes between the two parties. Um, and the truth is, you know, most people vote based upon um, individual candidates. Um, you know, they all really like, you know, a particular candidate. And, you know, they'll connect with them. They'll think they have a good smile and they say good things and, you know, they, say, they sound smart. And so we'll vote for that person. Uh, and so if you look statistically, most voters tend to vote uh, based on the person. And, you know, the, the party certainly plays a huge role. Uh, but it's not uncommon at all for people to vote uh, not just based upon the party affiliation, but rather to vote, you know, for an individual candidate based upon uh, their policies. Um, not that long ago, though, party affiliation tended to matter more to most voters. And a lot of voters would vote what they call a straight ticket, meaning that they would vote entirely for the candidates of one party or the other. And, and that party affiliation was the thing that really meant the most. And so they would, you know, as long as their party picked um, the candidate, then that was enough for them. They were going to vote for that person. In fact, in Missouri, uh, they don't do this anymore, but on Missouri election ballots, you used to have a choice at the beginning of the ballot. You could darken a circle uh, that would vote a straight ticket for every Democrat or every Republican. So that way you wouldn't have to go through and mark every single race, you know, uh, the governor and the senator and the congressman and all that. You wouldn't have to vote for every single office. You just vote for one party or the other and stick your ballot in the box and you're done. Um, but so few people do that anymore. They removed that option uh, just a couple of years ago. So um, voting habits change over time. But um, nowadays, you know, most people probably would say that the individual candidate matters more to them than the party that they belong to. Um, and so that's been something that has changed over time. Um, but you know, anyway, just because you say that, well, I'm a Democrat doesn't mean that you won't vote for a Republican once in a while and vice versa. Um, so that's how people's habits tend to go these days. The parties, of course, and when we're answering the question, who is the party, they also have an organizational structure and they have leadership. Uh, and that exists at the national, state, and local levels. Um, and so at the very, very top, you'll have something called the Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee. And their job is to organize the party on a national scale. And so they will try to organize their efforts, they'll coordinate fundraising, they'll coordinate the candidates that they're supporting, trying to get their message out, trying to get their party platform, you know, uh, out there. Uh, and they'll organize their party's efforts to get their people elected all over the country. And so there's a nationwide organization for both political parties. 
And so there's actually people whose full-time job is working for one of the political parties or the other. At the national level, um, there are also special committees. Um, there will be you know, a committee to elect Democrats to the House of Representatives or the Senate, for example. And so you have the national committee, but you'll also have smaller committees uh, who have more specific tasks, you know, trying to get as many congressmen elected from your party as possible or as many senators as possible. And they will try to figure out how to use the party's resources to best help the most candidates win uh, office. Uh, both parties also have a separate party organization in every single state. Uh, for example, there's a Missouri Republican Party um, and a state committee that organizes the efforts of the Republican Party in Missouri and uh, mm -hmm. trying to get its candidates elected into statewide offices, such as governor or attorney general or secretary of state. Um, and, of course, the Democrats have um, a state party organization as well. And so you have that in all 50 states. Um, you'll have a state party organization. Not only that, but every county across the state of Missouri has some kind of party organization um, as well. Uh, the counties are divided into voting precincts, uh, which are just kind of small districts, basically. And each precinct has at least one committeeman who is a part of the county committee. And so each county has some kind of committee. So you have you know, the county committee and the state committee and the national committee. And you kind of see how this organization grows um, statewide and then nationwide. Uh, for example, um, in Jasper County, where I live, um, the Jasper County Republican Committee is made up of com committeemen and a committee woman from every precinct across the county, and they'll try to work together and help local candidates get elected. And so they're worried about things like sheriff and county commissioner and mayor, and then the state organization is worried about things like the governor and the lieutenant governor and the secretary of state, and then you know the national committee is worried about congressmen and senators and the president, and so you have that uh, party apparatus you know, from top to bottom basically trying to get their candidates elected at every level. And so when we talk about who is the party, well, you know, there's people who, um, you know, work for the party full time, um, you know, or volunteer. You know, certainly they're part of it. There's the people who just identify with the party. There's the people who actually run with that party's label, you know, and get elected into office. So it's really kind of a complex question to answer, more so than you might think. Well, wrapping this up, um, in conclusion, um, certainly our founding fathers wanted nothing to do with political parties, but uh, despite their best efforts of trying to convince us they're a bad idea, and uh, they've really become an essential part of the American political process. It's really hard to imagine how American politics uh, could happen without political parties being involved at this point. And despite the ugliness of party politics at times, um, they do fulfill some useful functions. Um, they're getting people engaged in the political process across the nation, you know, from the national level to the local level. Um, they really um, play a big role in making the democratic process move forward, getting ideas out there, uh, different policy proposals, recruiting candidates, all these kinds of things that we saw. So um, sometimes they do ugly things. I'm sure there are times when politicians worry more about what's good for their party rather than their country at times, uh, you know, but uh, despite their uh, bad qualities, they do have some good qualities as well. So uh, certainly not completely a bad thing despite our founding fathers' fears. So uh, that's it for this topic. Um, don't forget there's a couple other topics this week as well. Um, I will see you in those.